Hello and welcome to Module 7. Can you believe how close to the end of the semester we are? The time has really went by quickly for me and I know for you taking uh, a number of different classes at the same time. Uh, today we're going to examine two legal issues uh, and that will be censorship and copyright in the context of school and academic libraries. <clears throat> Now, you may be wondering why school libraries? Well, simply put, because that's where censorship is often found. And more often than not, we find it in K through 12 school libraries. Now, copyright, on the other hand, affects both K through 12 and higher education. Thus, academic librarians should be well versed in copyright issues. Uh, and it makes sense when you think about the fact that you may often find yourselves uh, dealing with faculty members and other university community members, for that matter, that rely on you to know the boundaries associated with copyright issues. Now, uh, in the module, I've provided you with some practical materials and readings uh, so that you can learn the guidelines surrounding censorship and copyright. Uh, and I'll mention that for censorship, you should find the ALA materials uh, in particular very helpful. Uh, that said, this short lecture, uh, I will be focusing on the fair use doctrine. Now, fair use is one of those areas that seems straightforward on the surface, but there's a subjective element to fair use determinations that do add a layer of complexity. Now, additionally, when you're the one who is in the position of having to advise a faculty member about whether or not something is fair use, particularly since the faculty member in most cases wants to use the material, it can get challenging pretty quickly. So uh, with that in mind, we'll cover two example scenarios. Uh, and to the extent uh, that um, I think you'll be equipped to think through the fair use factors and weigh them in any given situation, uh, and ultimately, I think you'll come away gaining some confidence in your ability to make a reasonable fair use determination. So let's get started. Now, to get started, we will start with what is fair use. Now, fair use is based upon Section 107 of the Copyright Act. And Section 107 comprises the statutory framework <clears throat> for determining whether something is fair use. Now, if it is determined to be fair use, then we can say that there is no claim for copyright infringement. Uh, but what the fair use doctrine is intended to accomplish is to strike a balance between the interests of creators and users and to promote the freedom of expression and to permit the unlicensed use of copyrighted protected works in certain circumstances. And that's where the specifics matter understanding what those specific circumstances are can get confusing when it comes to copyright cases and fair use cases. Uh, now, uh, what are some uh, examples of what fair use uh, constitutes? Uh, well, what that means, fair use, is basically that it is using material for any of the purposes that you see on the slide Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research, all of those things may qualify as fair use. Uh, now, the research, scholarship, and teaching purposes, those can be instructive to us in understanding uh, why this concept of fair use is so important for academic librarians, um, because they are part of the community where research, scholarship, and teaching uh, forms a uh, core part of their reason for being, right? So it's like a, uh, uh, you know, a reason for your existence. You are there to support that research, scholarship, and teaching mission. Uh, we'll put it that way. Uh, maybe we could call it a core competency, right? So let's move on to the fair use factors then. Now, uh, Section 107 provides four factors for 
a consideration of fair use. Uh, so whenever we want to answer the question of some purpose being a fair use determination or not, what we often find is that this plays out in the copyright holder, um, you know, be that an artist, author, musician, poet, writer, what have you, uh, will accuse someone of infringing upon their work. Now, alternatively, um, these various creators may be trying to prevent others from using their material, right? So, uh, you know, trying to get ahead of that infringement. Now, of these two, the most likely scenario is the infringement one. Uh, and so um, that's what I'm going to focus on primarily in the examples. Now, not that you need to be reminded of this, but librarians are not lawyers. Uh, or uh, even if this were the case, you were a lawyer and you were also a librarian, um, you would still not be acting in the capacity as a lawyer. Either way, the librarian is not positioned to be giving legal advice. And so the person who's accused of copyright infringement, uh, or if the defendant if you prefer, may argue that their infringement was permissible, perhaps even under the fair use doctrine. And that leads us to how the fair use doctrine requires the court to weigh the four factors from section 107. Now, uh, of these four factors, um, we start with the purpose and character of use. Now, <clears throat> that includes things like whether it is of a uh, commercial nature or for nonprofit educational purposes, it gets into the uh, nature of the copyrighted work uh, and the amount used or sought to be used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And then finally, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the potential value of that copyrighted work. All right. So those are basically the four factors under Section 107. Now, one important aspect that we need to understand is that the fair use factors are not a rigid test. Rather, these fair use factors are intended to serve as guidelines for court. And that basically comes down to the fact that judges can adapt and adjust the fair use doctrine to apply in specific situations. Now, you've probably at one time or another heard someone describe a specific situation or a unique situation uh, as one that changes each time it is considered, maybe even using the phrase on a case by case basis. And that really gets to the heart of what we're talking about here, right? So it captures the notion that each time we evaluate a situation involving fair use, we're doing that in a case by case basis. Now, what are some important considerations that uh, we need to keep in mind? Well, flexibility and latitude, for one, allow the judge to look at the facts uh, that are laid out before them and consider the relative weights that they may want to apportion to these different factors based upon those facts. But isn't it at the same time also somewhat problematic? Good for you if you thought about precedent here. Uh, it becomes a little more difficult to set precedent when you're thinking about things and making judgments on that case-by-case -case basis uh, approach, right? Um, now, when things are fact-specific, it becomes easier to argue if you change one or two particular facts. Uh, and then you can argue that it, a different outcome is warranted. Now, in addition to making it a little bit more difficult to establish precedent, it's also important to realize that we're introducing this element of subjectivity. And that just basically means that if a different judge looks at the same factors when evaluating 
the same fair use determination, would a different outcome be reached? I think you would agree that that, that is in the realm of possibility because of the subjectivity. And if that occurs, then what we have is a situation in which, uh, really, um, it could call into question the equitable nature of our legal system. So there's a little bit of a, 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 a balance there between uh, trying to determine things on a case-by-case -case basis and, uh, you know, producing consistent opinions and judgments. Now, what does this have to do with you? That's probably what you're wondering at this point, uh, since it's not very likely that you're on a path to become a judge. Well, the relevancy to you lies in the importance of someone who may have to offer guidance on copyright questions, that you be able to understand the four factors, how the legal system looks at them, so that any guidance you provide to a patron uh, comes from a place of understanding and, you know, not guesswork. Uh, now, again, uh, this is a situation where you really have to think about what that balance or line is between legal advice and legal information when you're talking to someone about the application of the fair use doctrine. Um, so let's look a little bit deeper than in, into each of these four factors. All right. So uh, from the slide, you see purpose and character abuse. Now, this refers mainly to the function for which a person wants to use the material. And as I noted, copyright law favors encouraging scholarship, research, education, commentary, teaching. And so a judge uh, is probably more likely to make a determination of fair use if the defendant's use case is non-commercial uh, or educational, uh, scientific, something of that nature. And so obviously being on a campus environment college or university, uh, it becomes uh, easier, I guess, to make an argument that your purpose is educational, right? So you have an important element of context there. Now, the second factor is the nature of copyrighted work. Uh, courts will normally look at whether or not the work is uh, informational or entertaining in nature. And so a judge is more likely to find a determination of fair use when that material was copied from a factual work like a news article, say, or um, a biography or a journal, as opposed to a fictional work like a mystery novel or a poem. Now, we do have a landmark case that we can look at. Uh, that's uh, the Sony Corp of America and Universal City Studios. In that case, the Supreme Court said that copying a news broadcast may have a stronger claim to fair use than copying a motion picture, because copying a news broadcast encourages the free spread of ideas and encourages the creation of new material, uh, and further that this new material will benefit the public. Uh, and so, uh, based upon that case, what we see then is some consideration of who will benefit from uh, the specific use case of the fair use determination. Uh, and this definitely does tie back to the purpose and character of use. Now, uh, at this point, we should uh, point out that uh, the four factors are certainly not discrete. They're also not mutually exclusive, nor completely separate from one another. There are connections between all of them. And so when you look at them together, I guess in a holistic way, you get an idea of what our legal system wants to promote and what it wants to discourage. Now, the third fair use factor is the amount of copyrighted work used. <clears throat> this one's pretty straightforward. I'll let you think about that for a second. I'm going to take a drink. Now, um, how much of the original work did the potential infringer take or use? Now, you know, we can throw some things out there like, is it one sentence from a book? Is it one chapter of a book? Is it the entire book, right? So obviously those are three very different um, amounts of 
original work that were utilized. Um, if we couch that into the case of a movie, for example, was it a 20 second clip? Was it a six minute clip? Was it the bulk of the movie? Uh, and so what we can kind of draw from, from those questions then is obviously the shorter the passage, the clip, whatever it may be, the better it is from a fair use perspective in terms of a, I guess, positive judgment. Now, if someone really wants to use all of a book or all of a movie, then the other three factors then would really have to be weighed very strongly in favor of fair use uh, to act as a potential counterbalance. So again, you kind of see how the uh, four factors are uh, considered holistically. They work together, they're interrelated. And so, you know, maybe the amount of work used would be considered excessive in uh, most situations. But if the purpose and character of the use, if the nature of the work and the effect upon the potential value of the work are all heavily weighted towards a fair use determination, then maybe it's enough to overcome the amount used. And that leads us to the fourth factor. Uh, that applies uh, basically uh, on the potential market uh, of the work, right, or the, the value of the work. So here, what the court is trying to do is strike a balance between the benefit derived uh, by the public having access to the work, uh, and that, of course, if the use is permitted, uh, and the personal gain that the copyright owner would receive if the use is denied. So let's just consider, again, the case of a movie, right? Um, if uh, we were to offer a free screening of a movie, and let's just say that's at a public library, and a lot of people come to see that free screening, uh, those people may be less likely to go out and buy it on their own or pay to stream that content. Now, there are some people like me out there who basically uh, will will value that work, and I'm, I may be motivated to go out then and purchase that work where I may not have before. We, we should acknowledge that that exists, but in general, most people would think that if you can see something for free, why would you pay for it, right? Now, um, if that's the case, then it's reasonable to uh, draw from that or infer that the creator doesn't receive as much financial remuneration for their work, right? And so the idea here then is that if we're not adequately compensating uh, the people who are creating various works of art or uh, performance, then it uh, basically decreases their incentive to create them. And as you probably likely surmised already, it's not just a situation where, oh, the artist needs to get money but it's that artists need to be fairly compensated for what they contribute, right? So everybody's got to put bread on the table and, uh, you know, that's how the artists uh, earn their living. Okay, so um, I've heard though that when looking at these four factors, the courts generally are likely to focus more on the first factor and the fourth factor, right? So the purpose and character of use and the effect on potential value as, com as compared to those other two factors in the middle there, nature of the copyrighted work and amount of the work used of the total work. Now, that's not to say that those two factors are not important because they are, but if you look at reported court decisions, that's seemingly what the analysis tends to focus on. Now, we kind of took a deep dive there, and that was a lot of information. Uh, 
But the good news is that among other, many other skills, academic librarians tend to be really good at taking in a lot of information and then presenting it in easy to understand and digestible manner or ways for their patrons, right? Uh, and that's why we have so many good guides and infographics and other, uh, you know, resources coming out of academic libraries. Excuse me. And um, that includes the area of copyright, obviously. Uh, now, that's a great segue to a resource that I would like to share with you next. So um, that's uh, the four factors quick reference. And uh, so I have that on the screen now. Okay, there it is. Uh, now, there are so there are many of these so-called uh, quick and easy guides or quick reference guides, what have you, about how to handle copyright fair use issues that you can find with a quick uh, internet search, right? But the one that I recommend is uh, one shared by Miss Lindsay Gum on the Roger Williams University site. Uh, this infographic, in my assessment, does a great job of capturing the main ideas that I want you to take away from today's lecture. Now, the infographic covers the four different factors that we just talked about. What I like about it, though, is it shows those four factors on a continuum. Uh, and that continuum is, uh, you know, what you could use to make a determination on what is more in favor of a fair use or what is less uh, in favor of fair use. Uh, and that's important because you can kind of, kind of use this as a, uh, as a quick reference resource, uh, going forward. Uh, now when I think of a concept described or portrayed as a continuum, the first thought that comes to my mind is, okay, so these are not hard and fast rules, right? That's my immediate takeaway. Maybe that's because I'm a more visual person. Uh, but um, when I see something like that, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, and so what we can take away from this is, again, uh, reinforcing what I said earlier, is that these four factors are really a, more of a guideline than they are some kind of a hard or fast uh, rule. And I think it's important because in this respect, uh, the graphic should be helpful to you when you're navigating these, uh, you know, in real life situations and you need something quick to guide your assessment. Uh, now, but I want to point out something else here. Even these four factors are not the entire picture. Notice the bullets at the bottom of that graphic under the transformativeness uh, section. Uh, we can look at these as almost a fifth factor. And transformativeness asks things like, does the use involve something really new with the original work? Uh, does the use involve criticism or commentary like parody? Uh, uh, or does the use uh, provide significant value to the public? Now, answering yes to any or all of these questions probably makes it more likely that what you're proposing to do under the fair use doctrine is going to be found to be uh, or have a positive outcome, right? Okay, so with that, let's look at some fair use examples. Now, uh, in fair use example one, um, this, this is the first of the two examples that I have. Uh, now, the process I'm going to use here today, you can easily replicate yourself. You know, use your Google Foo skills uh, because you can find many different types of fair use scenarios online. And I would encourage you to do that for yourself, right? So that you can uh, build some confidence in your assessment skills there. But in this first example, um, let's say that a professor owns a copy of a book and she wants to make copies of that book, place those into some kind of a physical reserve for her students to check out. Would this be an example of fair use? Now, you might innate, innately just kind of think, of course not. But let's step through the four factors. You can kind of see how it's going to work, right? So um, here are the four factors. Again, purpose and nature. I'm sorry, purpose and character of the use, nature of the copyrighted work, amount of copyright work used, and the effect on the potential market for the work. Now, 
If you think about these four different factors in the context of this example, we can probably easily say it is for educational use, right? And so that purpose factor does seem to lean towards fair use. So why don't we put a check mark next to that one? Okay. Now, um, in this example, it is the entire book, right? Make a copy of the book. So it's the entire book. Uh, and um, that moves away from fair use, doesn't it? So let's put an X next to that factor. Okay. Uh, we don't really have enough information to the assess the book uh, for the amount of copyrighted material, right? Because we don't have the book in front of us. We don't have any idea what it's about. So we'll skip that one. Uh, and then what about the fourth factor? Uh, do you think that in this example, uh, the, there would be res it would result in harming the market for the book? Um, so making copies of a book and then putting them on reserve, I think we could agree that that's problematic. Uh, if for no other reason than that, um, why would the student who's on a tight budget go out and buy the book, right? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, um, put an X next to that one. And I think I forgot to put an X up there above. So um, uh, now the nature of the copyright work, um, we went ahead and skipped that one. So... <clears throat> So we've, we've been able then to basically assess three of the four, uh, four use factors. And, um, you know, it's not looking good for a fair use determination, is it? Even if it were on campus. So what alternatives do we have available to the professor in this example? Let's approach it from that angle. Uh, well, I mean, certainly the professor could acquire more copies of the physical book and put them on reserve, right? Uh, or the professor could request that the library purchase additional copies for its collection, which could then be made available to students through the reserve system. Either one of those would turn uh, both of these then into check marks, right? And so without even having the book, we've got 75% of our uh, four factors uh, leaning towards the fair use assessment. Uh, and the underlying idea, of course, is that, uh, you know, if we buy more copies of the book, um, then we're not hurting the market. Uh, and we are trying to find ways to ease access for our cash stretched students, right? So. It's kind of like a win-win. Now, uh, I'm going to take a moment to erase this, and then we'll move on to our second example. All right, perfect. So uh, in our second example, uh, we have a professor who wants to copy one article, a single article from an academic journal for distribution uh, to their students in a class. Now, let's go ahead and step through the four factors again. So you have them on the slide before you, purpose and character of the use, nature of the copyrighted work, amount of copyright work used, and effect on the potential market for the work. Now, again, this definitely seems like it is educational use. Again, I'll bring up that example of you're on a college campus, so it's a pretty easy argument that you have an educational rather than a commercial purpose behind your actions. So let's go ahead and put a check mark in that one. Uh, now, we should consider the source, right? It's an academic journal, so we can probably safely conclude that it's going to be research-oriented rather than fiction. 
uh, and we can lean towards favoring fair use. So let's also put a check mark next to that one. Now, what about the amount of copyrighted work? Well, it is one single article uh, as opposed to the entire journal. So we probably don't need to be particularly concerned. Let's put another check mark there. Now, finally, we have the impact on the market. Now, this seems less troublesome than the first example, but remember from our uh, fair use infographic, it's a continuum, right? So it may not be all the way to the right or the left. And perhaps this journal is one that requires a subscription. So, uh, you know, we have to assess that one carefully, but it is at least less problematic than my first example. Uh, and so we probably can, you know, say, okay, maybe this one is like, you know, a half thing, right? We don't want to say that it's completely against, but, you know, maybe there is some concern based on what that specific academic journal uh, is, whether we have access to it, to the university library, things of those nature, things of that nature, right? So uh, what we can conclude from this second example, then, is we have a pretty strong case for fair use. And in most situations, this probably would be ruled as a fair use uh, situation. Uh, now, we've made this situation, but we also have the fact that a lot of professors do this regularly in their classes, right? So even beyond the four factors, we can look at that transformativeness uh, bullet that we had on that uh, graphic a couple of slides ago. And we can also say that, hey, this probably passes the common sense test too, right? Some people will, would, call, would, would call that the sniff test. Um, and so uh, seems like a pretty clear cut example, right? Now, what happens if we change it up just a little bit. So let's say the same professor teaches the same class semester after semester, uses the very same uh, academic journal article, term after term after term, right? And let's just throw in there that it's a gen ed class. And so that class has hundreds of students in attendance. And every time, that professor provides the same article. In this case, then, we might want to give a little more scrutiny and assessment. Now, um, obviously, the repeated use and the large class size may, and I'll put that in air quotes, may weigh against fair use. But when is that line drawn? Uh, when is it crossed and when should we become concerned? Those are the questions we need to think about. Now, even if we rationalize this expanded scenario as common practice among professors, does this mean that it's always okay um, for that to occur? Uh, and we have to think hard about that then, right? Um, should we allow this practice to be engaged in. Uh, and then, moreover, uh, there are certain facts that could point toward uh, pertinent infringement. Uh, but again, you and I are not attorneys, and we're not providing legal advice. Now, I think we have to temper that somewhat, uh, because you will encounter professors who may be very determined to cross that ethical line. And if you're working with them, uh, say if you're a department liaison or in some other capacity, that's not on you as the librarian. It's on the professor. So what can you as the librarian do in this scenario? Well, Certainly, you can provide your perspective and uh, you're on safe ground to explain those fair use factors. But what I would stay away from is telling the faculty members what to do. Now, 
you could refer them to the library director or that they should le uh, seek legal counsel based upon your perspective on the fair use factors. Okay, um, now, despite the fact that this may not be an uncommon practice, uh, and we probably do see this all the time, uh, there are some cases where arguments have been made against this practice. Now, what do you think about uh, after walking through these two examples? Uh, hopefully you found that instructive. I think that fair use and practice can be a challenging exercise to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, particularly when you factor in other uh, real-world considerations, right? And when you're getting socially engineered by a patron, uh, to use a cybersecurity term, uh, you know, people can be persuasive. And so um, that's something for you to guard against. Uh, now, uh, I will say that uh, one such consideration is, let's face it, the price of textbooks. They are very expensive. And that's one reason why I, as a professor or instructor, uh, prefer to avoid uh, mandating that my students buy a textbook, right? Um, you know, as somebody who, uh, you know, made this journey myself, uh, I paid a lot of money for physical textbooks over the years. Um, and yeah, they were expensive even back in the day uh, on, uh, on my own tight budget. Uh, and to be frank, even though I kept many of those textbooks for years after the fact and would occasionally refer to them, I'm not certain that uh, I got the entire value out of the books in what I paid for them. Uh, and so I think about that often and I do my best to rely on other resources, right? Journal articles, other peer reviewed uh, sources, uh, stuff that's available on the web, because in the forefront of my mind, I'm thinking about students who have to go out and pay big money for textbooks. Now, a little clarity is probably due here, and that is uh, if a professor is telling a student uh, to go to the library databases to get the article, that doesn't raise fair use problems, does it? And that's because students are accessing that resource through the university's uh, library proxy uh, and a paid subscription. Now, not in every case, right? But uh, that's the due diligence that, uh, for example, I will do as a professor to make sure that that uh, resource is available through the proxy and a paid subscription, right? So clearly that is not a fair use problem uh, scenario. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, book chapters or sections, uh, or if I've provided a hard copy of a book to the library, um, you know, uh, that reserves process needs to be periodically reevaluated. Uh, and I think that uh, for the propensity of faculty, and I'll put myself into this bin, obviously, uh, we do try really hard to stay on the right side of the fair use doctrine uh, because we don't want to cross that ethical line. Uh, now, um, having said that, though, uh, what you've probably already gleaned from this lecture is that fair use certainly can be challenging. Uh, you probably will second guess yourself in any given situation uh, or scenario. Uh, but you can overcome this through practice and, uh, you know, a good healthy dose of common sense. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the final few slides here. And I've got some takeaways here. Uh, you can see those on the screen. I'll give you the opportunity to peruse those later at your leisure. Uh, of course, I'll post the uh, slide deck uh, into the module uh, after this lecture. Uh, and then uh, I want to show you again my professor contact info for your reference. Uh, and with that, uh, that's uh, all that I have for you in this lecture. 
uh, for this module, and I'll look forward to our discussions together online, and I will talk with you all later. Thank you very much.